five. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it is two after seven, so I think it's good to get started. I'm going to turn it over to my fearless co-host, Bridget, to do a little introduction. Thank you, Kate. So uh, welcome, everybody, to Conservation Conversations. My name is Bridget Sanderson. I'm the director of Environment Missouri, based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, you know, Kate and I kind of thought of this idea for conservation conversations when stay-at-home orders started happening, being put in place. And we still really wanted people to connect with nature and learn about nature and learn um, new aspects about nature and get a bigger appreciation for it. And so we came up with conservation conversations. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited about this topic. Uh, we will have a portion for question and answers at the end. So if you have any questions and you're on the uh, Zoom webinar, put them in the chat function. And then if you're on the Facebook live stream, by all means, just put it in the comment section. So uh, we will get to those at the end, hopefully all of them, keep them short. Uh, so I will turn it over to Kate. Thank you so much. Great. As Bridget said, I'm Kate. I'm the director of Environment Maryland. I am really excited about this topic because when Ian first suggested it and said there was some connection between the boreal forest and toilet paper, I had to know more. Um, so it is my pleasure to get to introduce Ian. He is our Environment America Conservation Fellow and he has been the lead on this campaign. So Ian, I will turn it over to you now to do, um, to talk about what we're talking about. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Kate. Um, and I wanted to thank all of our panelists from coming here. Um, it's, I'm very excited to have everybody and to talk about boreal forest. Um, I think I'll start with the basics for those of, of you who may be wondering what the boreal forest is slash how do I pronounce a word that, that's, that looks like that. <laughs> um, so I want to cover topics. Um, so people who might be wondering what is this forest, where is this forest, um, and as, as well as um, why it's something that we should care about, um, especially since um, some of us might have never seen it. Um, and I think right now, John is the only one on our panelist who's based in Canada. That might be not true because Jim might be in Vancouver right now, but I'm not totally sure. But um, I'll get started anyway. So um, the boreal forest is um, the largest intact forest ecosystem left in the world. Um, so mainly what we're going to be talking about today is the Canadian boreal forest, but um, boreal forests actually exist in Alaska, um, Europe, and um, in Russia as well. Um, the Canadian boreal forest is home to a vast array of wildlife, um, with among the most recognizable species being lynxes, snowshoe hares, little white little bunnies, and of course caribou, perhaps better known as reindeer. Um, the Canadian boreal forest is also home to many of our migratory birds. Um, so currently many of the birds that we see in our backyards um, are right now in their summer houses up in the boreal. Um, we'll get to see them again during the fall when they head back to their winter houses in the south and we get the chance to see them passing through. Um, the boreal forest is also a very important part of the culture of First Nations tribes and their members. Um, in addition to being their home, the boreal forest is integral to the traditions and spirituality of the indigenous communities. Uh, members of First Nations tribes play an essential role in the conservation of the boreal through land stewardship, advocacy, and policymaking. Um, also, very important, um, especially as we're feeling the heat in the summer months, um, the boreal forest is an invaluable carbon sink. It captures and retains many greenhouse gases that are released into our atmosphere and stores them in its branches, in its tree trunks, as well as in its soil. Um, this incredible forest supports many different facets of life, including a recreation and outdoor adventure economy, um, science and research, and of course, um, the reason we're all here, which is natural resource extraction. Um, so hearing about this incredible forest, um, it might lead you to wonder um, what kind of product would be worth cutting it all down for. Um, surely it must be something like a house or a beautifully crafted violin. Um, unfortunately, as Kate alluded to before, it's exactly the opposite. Um, we actually source a lot of our toilet paper products that we use in the U.S. from the boreal forest. Um, which is one of the most disposable products imaginably, imaginable. Um, companies like Procter & Gamble, which are the targets of the campaigns that we have been running, um, they make their Charmin toilet paper, the one with the bears, um, out of 100% virgin fiber, meaning that they source um, extensively from forests and exclusively from forests. Um, and these source a lot of this tissue product, which comes from wood pulp from the boreal. Um, so that leads me to another part that I also want to answer 
um, preemptively, which is um, my boss always makes me sure that I want to have an answer in my head for why Environment America? Why do we care about a Canadian forest? Um, and why is this something that um, U.S. environmental groups are taking a, um, a stand against? Um, so in addition to all those things that we just care about that forest and its beauty and its importance and um, the fact that our birds have their homes there. Um, it's also important to remember that um, the products that we buy every day um, have impacts in environment somewhere else. And most of the times it's environment far removed from ourselves. Um, companies benefit from this disconnect because they, we don't associate our purchases with instruction because it's so far removed. Um, but it's up to us to be aware that our purchases have impacts and to make decisions that limit that impact, um, especially when it impacts a very critical ecosystem. Okay, one last thing that I want to mention before I turn it over to our panelists. Um, the question that probably pops up in everybody's mind when they hear toilet paper, um, it was a news item a couple of months ago. Um, so a couple of months ago, my Google News alert that I set for the words toilet paper went from zero hits a day to 15 hits a day and more. And for a second, I thought the campaign had skyrocketed and that the story about the Boreal was out and people were going to start making conscientious decisions about the toilet paper they buy. But actually, it was almost exactly the opposite. People were making no decisions about what type of toilet paper they buy, only if it was there or not. Um, what felt like a real big step back at the time and definitely shook up our campaign um, has actually proved to be a bit of a silver lining. Um, people began thinking about what they could do if they don't have access to toilet paper. Articles popped out about the use of bidets and how America lags on a pretty much universal practice. People started learning more about an everyday product that they might, that they really didn't think about more. And some who never realized where toilet paper come from or the fact that it even came from trees started to learn that it actually comes from very important trees. Um, so positive or negative, um, what the toilet paper crisis has done is definitely led to different aspects of the campaign emerging. So I want to turn to Jennifer Steen, who is here from NRDC, um, who actually published a report recently called The Issue with Tissue 2, a follow-up to a report issue with Tissue 1, which ranked the sustainability of American tissue companies based on their sourcing in the Boreal. And I want to turn it over to Jen. Thank you so much, Ian, and thanks to, to Kate and Bridget for, for having me this evening. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for, for coming and joining. Um, so I'm an attorney with uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council's Canada Project and also a clinical lecturer um, at Yale Law School, and my work for the last five years or so has focused on the boreal forest and its importance to indigenous peoples, uh, the global climate, and to wildlife. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is some of the values that, that Ian already alluded to, um, why, uh, you know, this is an issue that the U.S. marketplace cares about and, and a certain, you know, that, that aspect of my work. Um, so as, I don't know if we have the slideshow. There. Great, so since most people probably haven't actually been to the boreal, here's uh, just a, a gorgeous picture of, of what that forest looks like. Um, so the, the boreal forest is, is a forest of tremendous local and global importance. It's um, home to over 600 indigenous communities, as you can see on the next slide, um, who very much depend on, on the forest for, for their ways of life, for their livelihood. Um, it is, also home um, to treasured wildlife um, species that Ian mentioned. We have, um, you know, the boreal caribou, which I know my co-panelists will, will talk a lot more about, the Canada lynx, um, the pine marten, my, my personal favorite. And um, it's also, as Ian mentioned, home to billions of, of migratory birds who, who paid us a visit while we were all in quarantine a few months ago, um, and will see us again in a few months from now. Um, so each year, three billion birds fly up to the boreal to nest, and then five billion fly south um, for the winter. It's also, um, you know, beyond its, its beauty, has a more invisible value as, as one of the world's most powerful carbon sinks. Um, it's actually the most carbon dense forest biome um, on the planet. And in Canada alone, the boreal stores twice as much carbon as the world's recoverable oil reserves. So this makes it of tremendous importance in the global carbon cycle. Unfortunately, um, we're, we're losing this forest to industrial logging at a, a very unsustainable rate. 
Um, over a million acres of the Canadian boreal are clear cut every year. Um, and Canada actually, despite its reputation um, for sustainability, has the third greatest intact forest loss in the world behind only Russia and Brazil. And so, you know, a lot of this is, of course, driven by, by logging, and this has really um, devastating impacts uh, across the board. So, for example, um, you know, wildlife uh, habitat is, is declining at a pretty um, disastrous rate. So, for example, um, only 15 of the 51 boreal caribou herds are actually self-sustaining in the long term. Um, indigenous peoples, you know, while they all have different relationships to the logging industry, um, many of them are not actually um, provided adequate uh, input into uh, the future of their lands and, you know, are experiencing loss of, of forests against, um, against their will. And, you know, finally, the carbon impact of this logging is having really, really severe international implications, releasing the carbon that had been locked up in this really carbon dense ecosystem into the atmosphere and also undermining the forest ability to continue, continue sequestering carbon and, and serve as and, and serving as one of our greatest climate allies. Um, so because of this, NRDC has been involved in advocating for policy solutions in Canada for, for years. Um, you know, the, some of the things we've been pushing for are greater um, investment uh, in Indigenous-led protected areas um, and, and guardians programs, so really putting the people who, who live on the land and know the land best um, front and center, and they've been the best leaders on this for decades. Um, boreal caribou protection, so um, advocating for provinces to implement protections for that that are you know on the books but that um, you know they've failed to actually execute on and addressing logging's climate impact through regulatory mechanisms um, and we actually have a report coming out a week from today that you can all look out for um, that's going to be covering uh, logging's climate impact and, and ways that Canada can address that loophole um, but to, to get to what we want to talk to today um, you know, this work isn't just about Canada because the U.S. marketplace um, actually plays a really huge role in, in driving um, industrial logging. As you can see, in the boreal provinces, um, over 80% of all Canada's exports end up in the United States. And while there are many sectors that are driving this, um, one that is perhaps the most egregious that that uh, Ian mentioned is the, the tissue sector. Um, so toilet paper, paper towels, facial tissue, these, these products that we use once um, and then flush away. Um, and unfortunately, um, most of the toilet paper found on store shelves today is made entirely from virgin forest fiber sourced in significant part from the boreal. And this is really driving a, a tree to toilet pipeline from the boreal directly to our bathrooms, you know, taking these old growth forests and, and literally um, flushing them away. Um, so because of the importance of, of forest for the climate, toilet paper actually has three, or toilet paper made from virgin um, forest fiber actually has three times the, the climate impact of uh, toilet paper made from post-consumer recycled materials. Um, so because of this, we had uh, NRDC um, and alongside Stand had been working with, uh, you know, on pushing companies like Procter & Gamble, which makes Charmin toilet paper, um, to, to change their supply chains and, and make toilet paper from more sustainable materials like recycled materials and alternative fibers. But unfortunately, um, they were unresponsive to those demands. So to educate the marketplace about this dynamic, um, since so many people have no idea that their toilet paper even comes from trees, let alone the boreal forest, um, we alongside um, Stand.Earth put out a report called The Issue with Tissue um, back in February of 2019, and, and you can see the first edition um, on the screen there. And what the, the purpose of this was to, to illustrate to um, the marketplace and to, to consumers um, the impact that these companies were having on, on this critical ecosystem and to put pressure on these intransigent companies um, to make the change. And you know, one thing to note, just especially since we have been dealing with the toilet paper shortage this year, is you know, this is not something, you know, while it's meant to inform consumers, it's not meant to shame anybody or um, you know, 
tell them that they, they can't have the goods that they need, especially when there are so few options on the shelves these days. What this really does is it, it breaks down that, um, that kind of shield that companies have put up between their supply chain and consumers and lets people know that these companies that are some of the richest companies in the world continue to rely on this really egregious supply chain. Um, so the, um, we, we ended up putting out a second edition um, a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the cover there. And what these reports do, um, kind of the, the most critical part of them, is the scorecard portion. Um, and we graded different toilet paper companies based on a number of criteria. Um, so you can see the grades there, and, and it's very kind of um, bifurcated. You have very good actors, and then you have very terrible actors. Um, and unfortunately, the very terrible actors are the ones um, that are kind of uh, most commonly seen on the store shelves. So Charmin, Cottonelle, um, Quilted Northern from companies like Procter and Gamble. Um, and we looked at a variety of criteria in, in grading these, these different brands. Um, so you can see the primary one we looked at was whether or not they used recycled content, specifically post-consumer recycled content. We also looked at the bleaching process that they used, which is often correlated with the kind of content that they used. And where the, the company was using um, virgin forest fiber, we looked at whether or not it was certified by the Forest Stewardship Council or FSC, which is the only credible certification system in Canada. Um, and I know uh, Jim is going to talk a lot more about kind of the corporate work and that that happened in the aftermath of, of issue with tissue. Um, but we were really surprised by the, the very significant conversation that the report spurred and, and we're heartened to see um, changes in, in consumer behavior. Uh, you know, while the biggest companies haven't actually changed their supply chains, we've seen a lot of new companies come online. Um, Target has a new brand um, of sustainable toilet paper. Uh, companies like Who Gives a Crap are out there and, and have really um, incredible um, uh, brands uh, from recycled material and bamboo. And it really shows that solutions are in reach and, you know, companies like Procter & Gamble just aren't um, embracing them. Um, so as, as next steps um, in our campaign, we're, we're going to continue to put pressure on companies like Procter & Gamble, draw attention to this, and also bring in uh, U.S. policymakers uh, who can have a, a big role to play in, in regulating the U.S.'s role in, in driving the treated toilet pipeline and intact forest loss. Uh, so I'll leave it there um, and happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I'm going to turn now to John, who I hope is not freaking out because I didn't give him as many guidelines <laughs> as I feel <laughs> um, everybody else did. But the reason that I really wanted to have John on is um, when I was doing early research in this report, in, in the campaign, um, I stumbled upon a report that you published, which was, um, I got the title here because I knew I wouldn't remember it, but Anthropogenic Disturbance in Population Viability of Woodland Caribou in Ontario. And I just really wanted... Um, to um, give you the chance to talk about um, that study, um, what you found, um, what prompted it, um, and um, just talk about kind of the, um, what you do in working um, in natural resource dynamics with, um, with fauna and um, yeah, and just give context to that because I mean, it's, it's almost like a cliche with every sort of conservation campaign, you need the iconic species to represent it. And the caribou is such a such a great version for that, and such so many people, including the indigenous communities that um, rely on the caribou and have such a cultural connection to it. Um, it's just a really important um, banner um, to ensure its conservation. So I want to turn to you, John. Well, I'm happy uh, <coughs> happy to be here. Um, I'm glad you didn't ask me about toilet uh, tissue because I'm probably the last person to uh, offer uh, any advice there. Um, but uh, Jennifer did do a, a great job of introducing us uh, to the boreal in a general sense. Um, I've been involved in boreal work for about 20 years. Uh, in fact, you had two, two of my species there and we worked on martens for about uh, 10 years. And we've been working on caribou for probably 12 or 13 years now. Uh, mostly in northwest part of uh, Ontario, a little bit up around James Bay. Some of that work continues, uh, and the reason we got started in that work was, you know, people have been concerned about woodland caribou uh, and whether they're sustainable or not for, for quite some time. 
but they're actually one of the, one of the most wicked problems really in a conservation sense that you can imagine because you know they're very scarce even at the best of times they live in an environment that's very difficult to visit uh, you know uh, those wonderful forest shots that you had are impenetrable it's very difficult to get access to large parts of the boreal very far from most civilized centers uh, so it's very costly to spend any time in the boreal uh, and so the traditional ways we would go about trying to assess the status of a species would be to count them, you know, uh, simply go out and get a sense of what, what their status is. But very hard to do that with, with caribou because uh, you would so very rarely see them. I mean, we've done flights across Ontario, transects literally across the province every 10 kilometers apart. And you might see a dozen uh, flying over the entire province. So, you know, it's like needles in a haystack. We know they're out there. There aren't a lot. But we would like to, to know dearly whether they are capable of thriving at those low densities or not. And so we got together with a team of scientists, you know, 12 or 13 different scientists across the province to put all of our resources together uh, with funding from the federal government, uh, some from the um, provincial government. And we also had to have funding from a variety of other industrial uh, sources because everyone recognizes that you know, that uh, the boreal zone is, is an arena that, you know, there are multiple stakeholders. And it's very important to, you know, arrive at some understanding. Clearly, it's a battleground in a conservation sense for many different actors. And, you know, what is really unlikely is that there will be a padlock put across the entire boreal. I mean, we all know that that's not the most likely kind of conservation solution. Um, but by the same token, we like to also think that, that it isn't a freeway uh, that's wide open for exploitation without any understanding. And so my role is basically to understand um, how much of a trade-off there is in terms of the fitness and the sustainability of caribou when they're exposed to uh, typical patterns of forest cutting and how we might be able to modify that practice through you know, either forestry interventions or through other kinds of in interventions that are available in a management sense uh, to try and, and modify those impacts. And so my role as a, as a wildlife ecologist is really to try and supply the information that we can use in discussions across the stakeholder community. And so our study was designed to uh, put in a massive amount of resources in a very short period of time uh, in several very large parts of Ontario to get as quickly a, a picture of, of what are the critical constraints affecting the, uh, the survival rates and the reproductive capacity of caribou in different places. And what we found, you know, in, in our study after equipping caribou with, you know, uh, radio collars and uh, we designed a special collar that had video uh, capacity. And so we have, you know, a rare opportunity to sort of see the uh, caribou uh, point of view of life and that gives some very important information about calving rates and their and the things that they eat uh, how much energy it costs to get those things and all that translates into models that allow us to predict what the impact of living in areas that have had forestry uh, are relative to the places that have it and you know the bottom line is that you know clearly our caribou are are, are struggling just as many are in places where there's been industrial forestry. Uh, but more importantly, we now have some information about what are the critical factors that can be modified. That is, if we were to adjust the road density, for example, um, how much of an impact would that have? If we were to, to change cut rotations so that we cut on, uh, say, a 75-year rotation instead of a 25-year rotation, what would be the impact of that? Um, could we design a, a program to uh, reduce the, the rate at which moose uh, re-inhabit the forest because they are an apparent comp competitor for, for caribou? So the problems are complex, but we feel like we actually now have some information that's on the table and we can actually have an intelligent discussion about what kind of levers you could throw to try and uh, reverse the situation, which nobody in the room uh, wants to go south, uh, quite frankly. So, you know, the topic tonight is actually pretty timely because this is exactly, you know, one of the things that we want. We want to bring that information to the wider community so that people know <clears throat> that now the science is there. We can actually have some informed discussion about uh, possible solutions. 
and get away from you know one size fits all kind of outcomes because pretty clearly that hasn't worked very well in the past. So I, maybe I'll leave it at that point and not get too technical about things. But if anyone wants to follow up, I'd be perfectly happy to uh, you know, to discuss any aspect. Thank you, John. That was that's awesome, and um, I appreciate. Um, the viewpoint and hearing all the information. I'm definitely a padlock type of person, but I understand. <laughs> I understand both views. Um, I'm going to turn to um, Jim Ace, um, who works at um, Stand Out Earth, um, and he's going to give a little more context on the organizing aspect of this campaign, which is, again, like John was saying, about how we're allowing people to understand um, this problem and really come to the conversation to um, come up with a solution. So with that, I'm going to turn to Jim. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Ian. Appreciate the invitation. Um, so, uh, hey, y'all. How's it going? Uh, happy quarantine. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, my bedroom in Bellingham, Washington, way up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Bellingham, by the way, is occupied Lummi Nooksack territory. And uh, as Ian mentioned, I work for a group called Stand. We started out as forest ethics. Uh, our, our, our origin story is actually connected to uh, Vancouver Island and the protecting old growth forest there uh, back in the 90s. And, um, and, uh, and what we're talking about now is a different forest. So that's temperate rainforest along the coast and the boreal, of course, is up, up north in the far, far, far north of Canada. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about corporate campaigns. Uh, you know, corporations, as we all know, very powerful institutions in our uh, in the world. Uh, they really shape really everything uh, about our lives: what we eat, what we listen to, what we watch. Ultimately, what we think uh, and um, so uh, they are very very powerful. Procter and Gamble, of course, is um, one of the biggest. Uh, I just looked up quickly some of their revenue just to give you a sense. 65 billion, 2017, $65 billion, uh, 32 billion in uh, net operating profit. In 2008, it was 67 billion, 2019, 68. In 2020, uh, the year that ended in, in uh, their fiscal year that ended in March, $70 billion in revenue, $70 billion. They're projected to go to 72 billion uh, by 2021. So a massive company and, and hugely profitable. profitable. They had, uh, uh, Twelve billion dollars of operating profit. So that's after all their expenses, all their paying, all their all their uh, everything paid out, all in twelve billion dollars uh, in profit. Just to give you a sense of the scale. Um, so a very powerful institution, a, a formidable opponent. So the, I think the question for us, uh, as people that care, I, f I feel like um, you know, there's lots of whys of why we should care. Um, but how do we how do we get this company to change? Uh, and that's really been I think what you know what my organization has tried to try to try to do over the last couple of decades is figure out theories of change to move these companies to motivate them to do the right thing. Um, and the idea with markets based campaigning is if we can shift the procurement uh, practices of these massive institutions away from the most environmentally harmful and, 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 and socially irresponsible practices to more responsible ones will shift that market uh, and over time um, move the needle to protect areas that need protecting. So uh, that's what this is all about. And I, and I hope that's why you all are here. Um, so at the end of the day, it all comes down to the P word. It's all about power uh, and building power uh, and generating leverage and how do we do that uh, against these powerful institutions? Well, it just, ha it just so happens that companies are really dependent on something um, that we actually have some control over, and that is their brand. It is arguably the most valuable thing that any company has, their brand. Their brand is really just their relationship with consumers. Uh, without that brand, without the brand, they have no way to distinguish themselves between any other product that's the exact same product or very similar product. So um, that's what gives us an opportunity. So we can, you know, when I think of corporate campaigning and how to move companies, yes, we can, we can certainly try to hit their bottom line. And if we can do that, fantastic. But that's often out of reach. Um, 
we can certainly try to occupy the mind of their executives, their decision, the decision makers. We can interrupt their relationship with their employees and try to drive wedges uh, amongst their staff. But uh, ultimately, we really have to threaten the brand. Uh, we have to create brand risk for them. And so that's what we're trying to do with Procter & Gamble is come up with creative tactics that will uh, ultimately add up to threatening the brand and motivate the company to, to take action. Um, and so that's really what we've been doing for the last, uh, for the last couple of years is um, doing everything, you know, that can include digital tactics, uh, using social media platforms to com certainly communicating directly to the employees as well, but also coming up with, um, you know, cheeky, fun, sticky actions that really get inside their head, but also get earned media coverage because one of the things that companies can't uh, find very hard to uh, um, mitigate is, is negative media coverage. And so uh, that's been our focus and uh, our objective over the last uh, year or so of this campaign and um, your help uh, and the help of, you know, the involvement of volunteers from around the world is really what makes all this go. Because without people power, um, you know, it's really, you know, in terms of building power, it's really about people power. That's what we have. We, we, they will outspend us. Uh, they can outgun us in, in terms of their marketing budget. But um, when we get a bunch of, of highly motivated, passionate people together, that's when we can make a difference. And it takes a surprisingly few number of people to move these companies. They're not used to hearing from consumers. Uh, they're not used to, and they, they, they don't want people to get angry at them. So when, if we can create the perception of a, of a threat, of a brand risk that could grow out of control, and I use uh, the analogy of a forest fire. So uh, we may, we may as, as campaigners, as organizers, as activists, we might lay the fire, but the company's the one who lit it. And it's really that threat of the wind blowing and that fire spreading that they're really afraid of. And that's what they want, what they want to get ahead of. And so uh, that is our job is to light those fires and then blow on it, fan those flames until the company decides they better do something to, to put it out. So um, I hope my, my, uh, my metaphor was <laughs> acceptable. Um, thank you for the opportunity and um, I'll pass it back to you, Ian. Thank you, Jim. I want to do a quick shout out to one of the digital tactics that stand.earth is great at. It's TikTok. Look them up. Um, one of my friends, or Dean, um, is making some great TikToks that, um, that are worth checking out. And also, always a great time to get the TikTok app before it's banned. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, but I actually, so um, I want to open it up to people to um, start pouring in questions. Um, but I have a couple questions that I want to um, ask the panelists. And I want to start with John. Um, so John, you were talking about um, the um, the like the main mechanisms that um, that really impact um, the caribou populations and their viability. And so, what are like the main forestry industry related impacts that lead to um, caribou populations going down? And like, which ones are the most likely to change in the near future? And what are the what are the ones that are probably unavoidable um, for the industry? Well, <clears throat> that's a good point. Um... I mean, there are certainly some things that are unavoidable. I mean, one of those things is, you know, is that climate change is a reality for all of us. And the boreal is, you know, changing really right before our eyes in some places that, you know, um, you know, are not going to look the same in 50 years. And we also have to be thinking about that. But in terms of viability of caribou, um, it would seem at the outset that, that the kind of obvious kind of reason why caribou struggle in, in, uh, in forests that have been cut is that they don't have, you know, the foods that they normally eat. And to some degree that's true because they live heavily on lichens. They have a very specialized uh, physiology. Their biology is very adapted to eating these very poor, lovely looking, but very poor uh, food items that almost no other organism on earth is, is adapted for. The downside of that is that, you know, they have to go where the lichens are and, and lichens take quite a bit of time to recover uh, you know, following a fire, a natural disturbance, but also following forestry. So there is a bit of that, but we don't think that that's really the key concern. The key concern is that when you transform a forest by cutting it, you turn it into 
a, you know, an early successional forest that has a very different group of, of tree species that uh, invade. And so that forest is, is actually wonderful for other species. Um, one of those species is the moose. And, um, you know, oftentimes people are delighted. I mean, that's a species we all love too. But from the point of view of caribou, the trouble is that it's very hard for them to live alongside moose because moose uh, can live at very high densities just because of the nature of their, their biology. And they support very high populations of, of, of natural predators as well. And so really the main risk that, that caribou face in a recovering forest that's had a, a lot of disturbance is that they have a high risk of predation, much higher than would be normal. Um, because you know they they simply don't usually run into a lot of disturbed forest in, in under pristine conditions. The boreal is a place where natural disturbances occur, and but those forest disturbances used to be fire induced mostly, and and uh, they were much more widely spaced, had much wider variation in size. So clear cutting operations with standard kind of cookie cutter kind of design aren't very good for moose uh, or for caribou because they're, you know, they're spread evenly across the landscape and it's very difficult for caribou to kind of find areas of safety. So it's kind of surprising really, it's, it's not the loss of, of the forest and the foods that they rely on that's actually the key concern, but rather that they're now exposed to an unnaturally high level of predation that um, is, is, is unleashed as a consequence. That's what stuck out to me when I first read your report was um, the idea of the wolf relationship and um, the easy access corridors. Um, I was just, I mean, it it clicked with um, with um, how it relates. And I know that's a big research focus of yours is um, is predator relationships. And yeah. um, I mean, but you know, it, 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 this is kind of a conundrum in, in the conservation world though, because you know, at the same time that we're talking about, you know, trying to modify the forest to, you know, make it better for, for caribou, we're also trying to design the forest so that they're not as good for wolves. And, you know, and we run into that kind of conundrum all the time, whether it's golden eagles and, and uh, foxes out on the, you know, the Channel Islands. Uh, you know, there's lots of examples of like, like this and where, you know, one conservation priority, you know, is not consistent with other conservation priorities. And so, you know, that's where, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, having the mo best information on the table is the best thing we can do because we're going to have to make choices that we're all going to be a little unhappy about sometimes. And you want to make those choices with your eyes wide open. And I think that's where information really becomes essential. Uh, I mean, I know this notion of having, a, you know, active campaigns is also really, really important. But I, I think the more information that we've got out there as a society, more effective we can be as consumers in responding to the pressures that come from all sides. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, my only follow-up is um, if if I can join you on your next caribou survey over there. <laughs> <laughs> that well, would be awesome. Bring lots of bug spray though. I, uh, uh, okay. There's a downside. <laughs> Good to know. Um, I'm going to turn to a question from the audience, which coincidentally um, is my mom who typed it. Um, but I'm going to direct it at Jim, but feel free um, anybody to come in. Um, so um, what efforts are being made to reach out to corporate boards of directors to make a case for their company's commitment to environmental sustainability? Yeah, every corporate campaign, uh, I think that, you know, most organizations run the first step is to send a letter to the CEO. That's just what you do is to try to open up a, a, a line of communication with the target, and by target I mean the decision maker. Uh, in this case, the CEO of Procter and Gamble is a guy named David Taylor, um, and so we di certainly direct uh, our correspondence to Mr. Taylor. And you know, it's such a big company with such a um, yeah, they have many different divisions, uh, and so there's many folks that we try to engage with and communicate with. Um, NRDC, maybe Jen can speak. Uh, in a moment to some of the engagement that NRDC is doing with uh, shareholders um, as well. But yes, we certainly want to engage with the decision makers of the company from the CEO to the board of directors and, um, you know, folks lower down uh, the chain um, because at the end of the day, this is a negotiation. And so while we are, you know, very much trying to, you know, to use the carrot and stick analogy, we are out there trying to motivate the company with the stick uh, on one end, we also wanna have that carrot where we're sort of uh, 
pointing to the solution uh, and the way that they can end the campaign, the way they can get, you know, turn the heat off, uh, get them out of the hot seat um, and, uh, you know, move forward together with a leadership commitment. Um, and so that's really absolutely essential to have both of those elements going, have the line of communication to the, tar to the target as well as the power and leverage and motivation because I, you know, I firmly believe just to push back, John, on something you said, I feel like we have lots of great science and lots of great facts. What we lack oftentimes is the political will. And so this is really about trying to translate um, the, the important research from our, our colleagues and friends and, and the scientific community um, uh, to package that in a way that will uh, motivate people to action. Uh, Jen, over to you on the um, engaging um, uh, shareholders, if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, um, just to just to add, uh, you know, there there are kind of a variety of ways of of getting to companies, and and Jim mentioned kind of the first um, line of of action is reaching out to the board, you know, seeing if they can they can make that change um, from the highest levels. Um, but you know, companies are you know run and operate from a variety of sources. So you know, there's there's shareholder actions that can be taken, and ultimately the company kind of derives its wealth from from its shareholders, um, who who actually have a lot of power over the company. So you know, one of the things that we we have done is is show up to their annual general meeting where there are shareholders and voicing our concerns, um, and you know, ensuring that that the people who who are kind of Holding, um, holding a lot of the company's wealth are well aware of, of inaction on that. And also looking to investors. Um, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard a lot about like divest from fossil fuels. Well, there's kind of similar um, actions that investors can take around, around um, brands that are driving um, unsustainable logging. And, and that's definitely an avenue um, that can have a, a major impact. We have two more questions that have come in from the Facebook chat. Um, the first one is for you, John. Um, do wood bison overlap with caribou? Uh, they do um, in some places. Western Canada, they do. Uh, wood bison are kind of a crazy situation. You have these, you know, these massive beasts. Uh, you know, they just are enormous. Uh, when you drive, when I drive right next to a wood, you know, a, a wood bison. It kind of dwarfs my pickup, which is gives you a sense of you know the size, and yet they live in the boreal forest, you know, amongst all these you know kind of smaller creatures. Um, but the places that they do best, you know, have it's kind of like the forest is uh, broken up, and and there's uh, you know some open swales and grasslands that they actually can can heavily use, and so they they migrate and move from uh, from patch to patch uh, through the woodlands, off with really well demarked. Uh, demarcated trails. Uh, it's almost like a super highway that uh, network that you can track along with them. Um, but they really are still eating grass and, and sedges and the normal things that bison do do. But uh, uh, yeah, no, they're, they're also key players. Not where I work in Ontario, though, mostly in Alberta, Northwest Territories and over there. Great. Um, I, it has been so interesting to learn everything that I have so far. I just want to say that. But the next question, I'm very interested in the answer on too. This is for Jen. Um, it says, is there evidence that consumers change if they learn more about the sustainability of different brands? So looking at your scorecard, I actually took some notes so that I could go back and be like, oh my gosh, am I, am I doing this? Um, and so I feel like there are for me, it's very effective. Have you seen evidence that that it has changed consumer behavior? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think the examples of of kind of more information changing consumer behavior are myriad and and have you know kind of run throughout the history of of environmental advocacy. I mean, just a year or two before we really got into the the, the toilet paper work, uh, you saw a massive movement around plastic straws, and you know, just kind of letting people know that the straw that they were using could end up in the ocean and, and kill, you know, a hundred year old sea turtle was really, really powerful. And you saw so many people changing, changing their ways and companies responded to that, um, you know, making straws out of reusable materials and, and pivoting away from, from um, single use plastics. And we have seen a shift in, in the marketplace around tissue. Um, you know, some of it, it to a degree is, is anecdotal, but I, I know that there's been a massive um, 
kind of upswell of, of just not like a huge, a huge response to, to the report and so many people who just had no, you know, similar to before the plastic straws information hit, who had no idea where their toilet paper was coming from. Um, and, you know, the, the, the rise of new brands like the Target Everspring brand, um, which is, is made from um, recycled material, is, is a response to that. And there is a desire in the marketplace to, to make that change. Um, but I, I'll also flag that, you know, ultimately, oftentimes the action needs to, the kind of the final decision and the final switch needs to come from the company itself. Um, you know, Jim threw out some of the statistics about the, the, the money power that Procter & Gamble has um, to, to make more sustainable supply chains and, and create a more resilient, sustainable world. Um, and, you know, of course, consumer action is, is super important to, to getting us there. Um, but there are there are other mechanisms that that he also alluded to, like um, political um, action. You know, if if a new regulation is put on the books that that forces companies to act, um, investor outreach, um, and and uh, you know that's uh, it's all kind of part of of one big uh, movement to to get the companies to shift in in whatever way possible. Because yeah, oftentimes they are very difficult to to get to move, especially when you're kind of going up against a behemoth like Procter & Gamble. Awesome. I actually have another um, question for Jen. Um, what are the big updates that happened um, from the release of issue with tissue number one to issue with tissue number two? Yeah, um, thanks for that. That was something I wanted to get more into, but didn't have um, time. Yeah, so the big update, is a non-update, which is that the, the companies that, that failed in, in the first report were still failing in the second report. Um, so that's um, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, and, and Georgia Pacific. Um, you know, there were kind of maybe slight, like, slight changes in, in some of their supply chains, but nothing that would, um, you know, make the shift that, that was actually needed. Um, but there were new actors in on the playing field. So, you know, the Target Everspring brand, we added brands like Who Gives a Crap, which has tremendous public um, admiration and visibility. And so you'll see, you know, the difference between our scorecards really comes on that, that side of the A category. There's so many more brands in that, that column, which is really heartening to see. That's awesome. Um, I'm sure we can get some sort of rotation out to people of um, so they can get their own copy of the scorecard. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I want to turn to John. Um, I have sort of a wishy-washy question, which is going to waste your scientific brain. But I read this great article um, called "What I Called um, Caribou Taught Me About Being a Part," which was released kind of at the start of the pandemic, and it was about um, it was about uh, the writer's journey with a herd of caribou who, um, and her reflections on that as she moved into a pandemic world. So my question for you is kind of what life lessons have you learned from the caribou? <laughs> uh, well, uh, sort of what life lessons have I learned? Um, well, I guess, you know, in a way, one of the lessons I think that comes from species like caribou is that, it, it, it's very it's very hard to stick around if you can't change with the times. I mean, and I think that's one of the difficult things that you know we all want to kind of hang on to nature as we see it around us, and yet it, every place you know on the globe is is changing very fast. Um, I mean, when you guys are talking about your campaigns, you know, when I was born, the population of the world was exactly half of what it is now, and when you guys you know uh, have your, your grandchildren the same things can be true too, you know? And so it seems to me, if you're gonna think about campaigns, there's some, some even more fundamental campaigns than, you know, whether we are, are you know, over stressing forest decline, you know, but rather I think that, you know, personally, I think the main campaign that we need to be thinking a little bit about is having just a lighter footprint in general. And, you know, thinking in terms of, um, you know, finding ways to kind of encourage people to maybe not have you know, as large families across the globe. And, you know, I mean, I think truthfully, these are kind of issues that nobody wants to face um, because they often carry kind of implications about, you know, deeper cultural issues and things. But that to me is the biggest problem uh, is not, our behavior is a problem, but even a bigger problem is that we keep doubling, you know, and the world simply can't handle that. We have to come to grips with that and our economies have to come to grips with it. 
So to me, you know, that would be, you know, the kind of discussion that, you know, all of us should be having at the same time uh, as we're kind of thinking about, you know, a little bit more sustainable practices, a better, you know, consumer practices. These are all important things, but modifying those things will have much less impact 50 years down the line than, uh, you know, changing our uh, population trajectory. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, I want to turn to um, Jim, um, kind of connected a little bit back to our current times. Um, how is the roles as a, um, an organizer and a campaigner, how has it changed um, to during a time where we can't really get together in ways that we used to? Uh, well, you know, truth be told, it's, it's been very challenging uh, because, uh, you know, and I think one of the things that, yeah, it's just very hard for a company to ignore uh, people out on their, on the, on their front lawn. Um, that said, uh, COVID has been an opportunity for us to get creative and think about how we can uh, motivate this company without boots on the ground, uh, without that tactical advantage. Um, and you know, I think that's something, something that John said earlier really resonated with me. Uh, you know, the idea that the internet and our ability, to, uh, the, the fact that we're so connected online is, um, you know, potentially a huge asset for us. And uh, the, the just things can go, things can change so rapidly. I mean, that's one of the lessons of, of COVID, right? Uh, how, how quickly things can change. Uh, so that's actually something that gives me hope is that, um, uh, you know, if we can use these platforms uh, and our, our, our social networks uh, uh, for good, uh, they can actually have a great impact. So uh, that's my take on that. What do y'all think? And it lets us have conversations like this over Zoom. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. Right. That's I'm gonna turn- thing. You know, I mean, uh, you know, think about it. The, you know, our ability to do this kind of communication instead of having to all be together, for example, uh, or flying, you know, these are, these are habits that, you know, could have a big impact. Sweet. We all are representation representing um, different places right now. I'm in DC. Kate, I think is in Maryland. Jen, I'm not sure. I, oh, I shouldn't have started guessing. <laughs> I'm in Syracuse, New York. <laughs> Syracuse. And John, you're in Ontario. Yep, that's right. Awesome. And Jim is in Bellingham, as he said. Um, I'm going to thank, I want to just thank you all because I'm about to turn it over to Kate for some closing remarks. But this has been so fantastic and um, I've really enjoyed it. And thank you to um, everybody watching um, and for your questions. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I was just in Syracuse uh, a couple days ago. My partner's family is from there. We were at oh, like. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, I never thought I'd be spending more than a week or two in Syracuse. My partner's mom lives here and we ended up being here the last four yeah, months. Yeah, so. that's, how, that's how you end up in Syracuse. Um, <laughs> exactly. and, and I want to thank you all too. I think what has struck me, we've got one question that I, I and Bridget and I end every conservation conversation with, but what has struck me so much about this conversation is the different strengths and the different perspective that each of you kind of occupy and bring. And it has been incredible for me in, in my role as, a, as the director of an advocacy organization to hear how it is all of these tactics and all of these pieces that are coming together and are um, uniting us around the world, around this forest and this conservation. And it's, I have heard some things that have, have challenged me and have grown my ideas around conservation and around the way that we structure campaigns and this has just been but i just want to say that to say thank you and to say thank you for your work and for all the individual work you do because i know from my experience that none of it happens without everybody um which is i think you know jim mentioned people power and it's just so thank you all and thank you everyone here who cared enough to take an hour out of your evening to come learn about the boreal forest so the question that we end every week with is, and we'll go through all, all the panelists, you know, people get on, we've got, you know, after this we'll end up getting hundreds of views on the Facebook Live and it's from people who care. What is the one, you know, your one walk away with topic for what we can do to help, what we can do to, to make a difference in this issue, what we can do in our lives to help protect the forest, um, 
So your, your kind of top thing that everyone should do right now, right away when they leave. So we can maybe start with you, Jennifer, and, and go through the panel. The heart, it's a big question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Jim Jim alluded to the power of voice and and I think embracing that and making the most of it, you know, a lot of people are like, what what can an individual do? The answer is a lot. Um, so whether it's, you know, sending a tweet to Procter & Gamble or calling um, your congressional representative to tell them that, that climate change and forest protection are important. Um, these are all really critical measures and the more voices we get on this, um, the more power we'll have. John, do you have a, a solid piece of thing, something we should do right now? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I can come back to the same thought that, you know, always ask yourself how you, re how, how you can reduce the impact of your footprint, you know? I mean, because these are all symptomatic of a, a wider kind of malaise that we have as a society. And, uh, you know, this is an important issue, but it's not the only one. And, uh, but, you know, I think for all of us, it behooves us to ask if there's subtle ways we can do that. Right. Jim, how about you? Jim, you're muted. That was such an amateur mistake. Oh, come on. You made it to the end of the whole oh, car. <laughs> totally fell on my face there. You look so animated, too. Oh, God. Yeah, that, it, it would have been good. All right. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, so, you know, a wise person once pointed out uh, pointed out to me that it, social change happens at the individual level, interpersonal level, the group level, and then institutionally. And, you know, certainly the individual choices that we make. So even if it's buying recycled, getting a bidet, great. Uh, but how, how to maximize that? Communicate about it. Tell your story. You know, uh, those kinds of stories, believe it or not, I mean, I would love to have the story of how many are on this call? 10 folks on this call, I would love to have you be able to amplify your stories of having attended this webinar and then switching to uh, recycled toilet paper and then uh, how, great, how great it felt uh, both emotionally, um, but also how it helped and how, how it helped the environment, but also how it saved you money, right? So we would love to amplify those stories. So your individual choices can make a big difference, um, both, uh, well, in the campaign in particular. Um, so that's one thing is just, you know, make, make different choices, having conversation. I challenge everyone on this call to talk to at least three people about this conversation, talk to at least three folks, whether it's family, friends, colleagues, uh, about what you heard tonight. Um, and number three, um, you know, it's really about, I think what Jen said, collective action. So not only individual action, but collective action. That's what really, what, what gives us power. And so, uh, if you can write a letter to the CEO. Trust me when I say they don't get many handwritten or uh, you know individually written letters. So writing a letter to the CEO of of Pro David Taylor Pro of Procter and Gamble would have a great impact. Sharing that with us so we can amplify it on social media and inspire other people to do that. Right. So we're always looking for ways to take individual choices and individual individual actions and amplify them and leverage them. So um, those are my three asks. One, uh, buy recycled but communicate about it, so we can tell your story. Number two, have a conversation with it, three, at least three people. Uh, and number three, uh, write a letter to the CEO and, and share it with us so we can amplify it. Thanks for that, uh, thanks for that question. And, and to build off of what, what you've said, that's so great. You know, we have, you had mentioned, we've got, I think, 10 or 15 people on Facebook Live. That'll grow after it's finished. We've got 20 people on here. So, you know, with your math, if all 60 of us go talk to three people, I mean, that, that's the, the ripple. And so if anyone on here does have that story, tweet it at us, tweet it at stand.earth, email it to us. Um, we want to hear it and we want to share it. And then Ian, I do want to let you answer this question too, because you have been engaged in this work for, for a couple of years now. Uh, Jim had such a good answer. I want to end on his. <laughs> I do fault to what Jim said. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, just thank you guys for watching and thank you for caring. Awesome. Thank you all so much. For all of our guests, if you have any questions, please get in touch with us. We encourage you to follow NRDC, Stand Daughter, to, to John, Ian, what's the organization? I'm missing the last organization. John is at the University of Guelph. 
so it'll be hard to support, but read his report. It's, but it's read everything that John has yes. ever written. Yes. Ever. Um, follow all of these great organizations. Stay in touch with this work. You know, as has been pointed out, there is going to be new science. There are going to be new campaigns. There's going to be new pushes. So stay in touch with what everyone's doing. So our panelists, thank you again for your work. This has been such an honor for me to get to learn from all of you. And um, thank you all for coming. And don't forget to let us know when you have your three conversations and when you switch to recycled toilet paper. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all. Have a good night.